I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel De Laurentiis. He is a professor at Purdue University's Aeronautics and Astronautics Engineering School. Uh, he also serves as the director of Purdue's Institute for Global Security and Defense Innovation in the, in the university's Discovery Park. Um, and his primary research interests include areas of problem formulation, modeling and simulation, and robust system design and control methods for aerospace systems and transportation architectures. Um, if you could please welcome our moderator and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, and it's a pleasure to be up here moderate, moderating our second panel. Uh, as much as I have an interest to do so, my job is to not talk at all and, and really uh, help uh, just shape with an, an opening question for our, um, our panel. And uh, I'm quite confident that uh, they're going to be continuing the conversation that's been ongoing today. But in particular with this panel, we'd like to maybe dive a little bit deeper on some of the issues related to the specific um, uh, issues and possible solutions that relate to some of the boundaries that uh, were discussed perhaps more broadly so far related to uh, machine intelligence and its deployment in the battlefield. So with that context, what I'd like to do is have each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. You've obviously uh, heard from Peter and you will hear from Heather shortly, but have each of them introduce themselves and then in the context of that short introduction, to sort of get things kicked off, I do have a, a prompt question that I would like to put on the table for them to react to as they introduce themselves, and then we'll move on from there, and certainly as we did for the first panel, um, uh, eventually have participation with questions from the audience. So uh, my prompt question is, what is a good example of a boundary condition that we might use to demarcate acceptable use of machine decision making in warfare? And I propose to ask Heather to go first. Uh, you're our anchor, uh, and followed by Ron, Sharif, and then Peter. OK, wow. Uh, I was thinking Peter would go first, because he's over here. Um, I think a, a boundary condition. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of harken back to what, what Bob said uh, before. We've been using machines to make decisions in war for a very long time. So this isn't a new condition, right? Um, I think, so we have to look at what we already automate and what we already use machines to do uh, within warfare and within strategic planning, within logistics, within healthcare. Um, and then we have to ask, what are the new areas where humans have started, it's been the primary domain of human decision making and judgment, and whether or not we feel comfortable uh, delegating that authority to make the decision to a machine. And so it's that delegation of that task uh, to a machine in, an, in a new space. Uh, when it comes to machine intelligence, there are certain aspects of machine intelligence that are more easily amenable to decision making than others. Uh, as Bob also alluded to in his talk, he talked about narrow artificial intelligence. And I think when we talk about narrow AI, what we're talking about is uh, kind of savant-like qualities of doing one task maybe too very, very well. That is not a general intelligence that can undertake complex judgments, um, have common sense reasoning, and things like that. And so if we want to have a boundary condition, I think one of the boundaries you want to think about is, do I need common sense for this task? If I need some sort of common sense, this is not something that I want to hand over to a machine, because machines are very, very good, and they're very, very stupid. OK. I guess you can hear me. Uh, my name is Ron Arkin. I'm a Regents Professor in the College of Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I'm one of the, I guess, relatively few technologists that are up on the stage. I suspect there's a good number of you uh, out there. I've been a roboticist for 35 years and a robot ethicist for about 15. It took me about 20 years uh, to wake up to the potential implications of the technology uh, that we were making, and now I'm trying to encourage my colleagues uh, to do the same. I'm uh, doing a lot of active work still in research, a DARPA subterranean challenge with my colleagues in Australia, robot deception, um, working on competing ethical frameworks uh, for decision making in uh, elder care and child care, variety of different things. But where I've gotten most of, I guess, notoriety, is that a fair way to characterize it, uh, is the work that I did for the Army Research Laboratory uh, Office, excuse me, Army Research Office 
around 2006 to 2009, uh, the book that came out was Governing Lethal Behavior in Autonomous Robots, which talked about a potential way in which we could embed uh, uh, the ability uh, for compliance with international humanitarian law uh, in robotic systems. I never said it was the best way. It was a proof of concept. But it is a potential way to be able to try and make robots, if you will, moral or, or ethical in this very narrow, bounded context, not general human morality, which is way beyond the reach of anybody in AI uh, into the uh, near to mid, perhaps the foreseeable uh, future. But let me get now to your prompt question. Um, there are certain things, and it was, I just was looking at uh, uh, Paul's book uh, earlier. We did an interview, and I just actually looked at what I said, which is always helpful to do after the fact, to see, do it, that I really mean that. Uh, and one of the things that uh, was in there uh, was a boundary condition, which I have es established and I've always held to, which is uh, the generalization of targets in the field or in situ using machine learning. I do not believe uh, robots should do that in an unsupervised manner. Uh, even if we do allow them to pick out of a set of target signatures, they should not generalize on their own as to, that looks like something that's a bad guy, I'm going to engage with that one. So uh, that is uh, probably one of those. Uh, but the thing I want to emphasize the most is my focus has not been, unlike what we may have heard from some of the other speakers, on winning wars. Uh, my focus has been on, is twofold. One, in providing our young men and women in the battlefield the best possible technology that we can provide, but without losing our soul in bites or otherwise uh, in the, uh, uh, as we do that. And in particular, to do that by putting a focus on non-combatant casualties. The key factor from my point of view is how can we potentially outperform human warfighter, warfighters, uh, if at all, uh, in the battlefield with respect to non-combatant casualties and property damage. That's a testable hypothesis. I will not say it's been achieved in any way, shape, or form at this particular point in time, but I would argue that these systems should not be released into the battle space until that condition is met. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sharif Kalfi. I'm an active duty naval officer, having uh, served the past 23 years. Uh, by profession, I'm in the surface Navy, so having worked on warships, and uh, most recently I commanded a warship in the, out in the uh, Indo-Asia Pacific region, and will return to do so here later this year. But by uh, research and academic background, I have a master's in computer science, a specialization in artificial intelligence, and then as well as public policy, and I have uh, spent the last couple of years work, work, working both at a think tank and now at uh, being at Princeton, looking at the uh, intersection of AI and autonomy, unmanned vehicles and systems, and a national security policy with regard to uh, these unmanned systems and employment of them in potential conflicts, uh, looking at that intersection in order to determine how the Navy and DOD could accelerate the research and development and the test and uh, evaluation of those systems for a future operationalization. And so uh, that's uh, kind of what has brought me here today. And then having been able to operate in that, uh, in the environment where these things will be able to employ, to be able to think and talk about how these systems could be real, realistically fielded for those uses and what maybe their drawbacks are that we need to take a look at. Um, to answer the, the, the question today regarding the boundary question, I think it's useful for us to uh, sometimes maybe take a, a step back to look at what is useful now and what will be in the near term. Because uh, as my research study had taken me to over 50 different places around the country where R&D is occurring in autonomy, uh, what, I, what I have termed mission autonomy, you know, the brains by which some of these systems will be able to operate and conduct useful things for conflict, military, and warfighting. Uh, as I visited many of these different places engaged with people, uh, I see that there's actually a more near-term, very useful aspect that they could, uh, that they would be helpful for us to do. And that, uh, and instead of be focusing so much on autonomy, focusing on semi-autonomous uh, human on the line, uh, not necessarily human in the loop, but human on the line, uh, supervised uh, or supervisory uh, uh, supervisory examination of them, in order to allow them to operate a set of useful features uh, in the field, whether it be unmanned undersea vehicles, surface vehicles, or air vehicles, and be able to assign a certain number of, uh, of missions. But similar to me, as I was as a captain of a ship, uh, there is a domain of different activities, uh, all the domain that I could do as a, a captain of a ship, but there, within there is a subset of actions that are not my purview to do, and I must seek higher authority 
in order to perform those. And a lot of those often uh, revolve around offensive, taking offensive operations uh, and other type of activities that are you know, significantly escalatory. So I think within there lies the realm of very useful technology where we'll be able to assign these type of vehicles to do important things, to go out, search, to identify, provide feedback, but not necessarily have them because uh, we're not there yet, and the technology, from what I've seen visiting these different locations, is not even close to being yet there yet to be able to allow them to make decisions on their own. Uh, and so be able to have them do, do these identification, do these searching things, but then if they find something that's useful for us in the military context, where we want to take, maybe take kinetic action, that then it, it radios or signals back in order to get that verification. This is what I see, this is what I'm doing, this is what I would like to do based off the rules of engagement and the mission you've told me to do, and then from there be able to uh, get an approval, similar to what we would be able to do out in the field you know, as a warship if we were taking offensive action. Uh, so that's kind of where I see the boundary condition being right now. Uh, sometime in the future, we, you know, when autonomy is truly uh, more generalized, it will obviously need to be able to take a look at that. But the more useful technology, I think, is now to be able to pursue those with all due vigor in order to uh, have them militarily useful on the uh, battlefield and at sea. So Peter Singer, you heard from me earlier, relevant to this topic, uh, did a past nonfiction book called Wired for War that looked at the robotics revolution and then a fiction look that visualized some of the uses of these technology uh, in a future conflict called Ghost Fleet. I'm gonna answer your boundary question um, literally uh, and, and try and identify what I see as two potential boundaries that might be set to steer this space uh, drawing upon what's been possible in the past. And one of the types of boundaries is a geographic boundary, and the other is a temporal boundary. So a geographic boundary, um, we know in the past, whether it's um, setting off entire domains to certain weapon systems. Uh, so the United States, the Soviet Union uh, certainly didn't get along, but we were able to come together on a treaty along with the rest of the world that said outer space is off limits to weapon systems. Uh, so it might be an entire domain. A parallel to this in the um, uh, space of um, autonomous weapons and robotics would be um, the issues of if the concern is like Ron's on, um, in particular, uh, civilian casualties, there is a, it is a far different discussion if you're talking about an urban zone versus if what you're bringing up, you're talking about domain of um, undersea operations. You get it wrong in a city between, or the robot gets it wrong in a city between a tank and a school bus, and you have a tragedy of uh, you know tens, hundreds dying you don't have the problem in the undersea domain of at least so far, um, you know, uh, cruise ship submarines, right? Uh, you can unleash, so to speak, you can have more autonomous actions in an underwater domain in a way that would curb some of the prevailing concerns and some of the different movements. So you might see, uh, rather than um, a push for outright bans, you might say uh, coming together at least around certain domains. There is a history uh, to this. Um, over 100 years ago when we looked, uh, there was a new technology that was feared. It was um, mines at sea. And uh, even with those, they came up with limitations. Um, a similar night might not be an entire domain, it might be a geographic setting. So with mines at sea, this is back in the early 1900s, um, all the nations so thought they were horrible, but also thought, yeah, we'd like to use them ourselves. So they ultimately agreed you could use mines as long as it was within a defined war zone and it was not free floating because that would endanger, endanger the entire world shipping. So you could have mines outside your harbor, you just couldn't unleash them. So you might imagine a very similar thing with unmanned systems where you say, okay, uh, for example, if it's geographically fixed along, um, as you know, Paul discussed, we're already seeing them in border fortifications of the like, and you have a declared location, that's certainly a lot different than if you just let it free out in the world. A second type of boundary is a temporal boundary. So both with old-fashioned mines to move forward with anti-personnel mines, 
we essentially have said you can't let them be armed and dangerous forever. It has to have kind of the equivalent of a, of a self turnoff switch. The very same phenomena happened with what I would argue is already the first autonomous weapon system, which was Stuxnet. We don't talk about it as an autonomous weapon system because it was software, but if it had been a physical robot, it was basically given a, a set of targets in the world, a set of protocols to follow, and then unleashed. Stuxnet, go out and hit that target. If it had been a robot, we would not be having this what if discussion. It operated, but Stuxnet was designed to have a self-destruct. So it could go anywhere in the world, but it could only hit a certain type of target. But after, if I recall correctly, 18 months, it turned itself off. So you could imagine similarly temporal limitations around weapon systems where we, and it might not be 18 months, it might be 30 minutes, whatever it is. But these are definable boundaries that we could cling to rather than kind of having more esoteric discussions uh, that I feel like has held us back in a lot of this um, back and forth between the arms control community, the scientific community, and military operators. Anyone have a reaction to some of the discussion? I want to just follow on what Peter said. So. Um, I forgot to introduce myself too, sorry. I'm Heather Ruff, uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and also Brookings, and also Cambridge. Um, so the work that uh, Richard Moyes and I did with Article 36 on meaningful human control, right? So several years ago, uh, so Paul and I and others have been involved in, in the discussions at the United Nations, the CCW, on autonomy and whether or not there should be a preemptive ban. Uh, Richard Moyes is the managing director of an NGO called Article 36. Um, and he and I came together um, and kind of fleshed out this concept of meaningful human control. And that's exactly part of, of this kind of concept, right? Thinking about spatial and temporal um, restrictions, right? That you need to have what we call meaningful human control over direct attacks, right? And so a, a, an attack, if you think of a, the attack as a unit, um, that could be engaged in multiple kinds of attacks. It's not defined in, in international law. Or it could be you know, one particular attack but that notion of an attack is also a boundary, right? And it's a boundary in time and space. Um, and so if you say, I'm gonna you know, have, use autonomous systems in an attack, that's fine, but the human has to define that attack space, define temporally and spatially what is okay and what is not okay. Um, so that's another kind of way, I think, to, to kind of get at that is thinking about meaningful human control over direct attacks. And elaborating on that just a little as well too. This is kind of a geographic boundary, but it's also a political boundary. We had an interesting uh, meeting at the Halcyon Dialogues at uh, AAAS uh, in Washington about a year and a half ago, I guess it was, uh, with police forces and others about the use of uh, military technology. Uh, I don't believe these systems should be used uh, in domestic settings. I, that to me would be a boundary where they should be limit the civilian blowback that we often get from military technology in a variety of different ways is often inappropriate, I would say, from at least from my point of view, and potentially unethical to be used against our own citizens uh, in this context. As was said earlier, soldiers uh, and warfare is about killing the enemy. Uh, hopefully, we don't view our own citizens as the enemy uh, with respect to that and turn this technology uh, loose on our own. Uh, on our own. If, if I could build on that, we maybe have already crossed that line if you'll recall, um, a couple, uh, I think it was two years back, we had the um, sniper in Dallas, and the police used um, the very same technique that, um, you know, so we, we have this like discussion around arming robots, but, um, and it shouldn't happen, da 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 da, but as, you know, I wrote, I wrote about this in, um, so in the book was in 2009, the incident, if I recall it correctly, in Iraq was 2006, and essentially soldiers in the field were ad hoc, ad hoc arming them themselves. They were duct taping mines onto a surveillance spot and then driving it down an alleyway and then detonating it, um, which was exactly, they did that in Iraq over 10 years back, and that's what this Dallas police did. And um, I think, you know, I share your concern about moving in, into the law enforcement context. And it's not just the idea of um, using it against citizens, but rather than, you know, kind of Monday morning quarterbacking um, Dallas police on why they did that and, you know, why they didn't use non-lethal weapons or like. My bigger concern is 
in the United States, unlike the military, where you have a, a defined set of doctrine, training, and it's consistent across the force, in law enforcement inside the United States, basically every state and local PD kind of figures out, they have, you have multiple different tr police academies, different rules, and so the reality is with robotics in a law enforcement context, just like everything else, good police departments are gonna handle it right, and the Fergusons of the world are gonna do it in a really dangerous, scary way. And so I don't wanna defer to each little police department to figure out how to use robotics on its own. Pete, I wanna go back to one of the, uh, the comments you made earlier I thought it was really important. I wanted to kinda uh, explore that a little bit more about the uh, temporal and the geographic uh, boundary aspect of that. Uh, because that, that's very important to be, and I think it lends itself to not just ground, but also maritime as well, especially the maritime type of uh, conflicts and usage of these things, because we do have so much more battle space and ability to define where we would like to operate and what things we'd like to do. Uh, to kind of pivot from onto that point, one of the areas that I think does not get enough attention, we talk a lot about machine intelligence and what it could do for us, but we also recognize there's a lot of opaqueness to it. We don't really, you know, the explainable AI is only at the beginning, so we really don't know sometimes where the decisions are being made. We've seen that with, you know, examples of AlphaGo, uh, and, you know, the program that was able to come up with these very, you know, human mind-defying types of uh, moves in order to beat humans and things we'd never seen before, but they really couldn't explain why it was coming into that. Uh, and we're gonna see some of those same things as we look at putting these type of machine intelligence into mission autonomy. And the one area uh, that I think really gets kind of the short shrift that I've seen during, during my travels has been the, the test and evaluation aspect of these. Uh, the test and evaluation to build that trust building regime and mechanism by which operators, the politicians and policymakers, leaders, the warfighters on the ground are going to be able to believe that when we put these systems into the field, they're going to do what we want them to do and that they will observe those geographical and those temporal boundaries. And it's an area where I feel that uh, we, although we talk a lot about machine intelligence, equal to, and, most, and as important to that is how do we test to make sure that those systems will do what we want to do in a way that we are able to do with conventional, uh, conventional weapon systems where we gain that uh, credibility and that trust in the test and evaluation process. Maybe I can pick up on that, uh, Sharif. And uh, so, you know, T&E is critical for, for building evidence for trust, right? Uh, for users as well as people surrounding these technologies and their use. Um, I, I want to sort of probe a little bit, and I, I want to phrase it as best as I can so that it doesn't get too close to science fiction, but uh, some of these lines are blurred. So while we struggle right now to create uh, better uh, trust and explainability from AI and these technologies, the research is gonna happen, right? And some of the, these artificial intelligence technologies will in fact progress to perhaps be starting to approach the ability for judgment and the ability to do more complex judgments um, that might get close to human capabilities. So my question is, uh, knowing that we can't tamp down research you know, uh, of this kind, how should we be prepared to incorporate in technologies of this kind that will be closer to providing perhaps a better judgment in some trade-off problems than humans can do? Anyone wanna touch that? Okay, I'll bite. Um, so, DeepMind was mentioned um, before with Go. DeepMind's mission, as is OpenAI's mission, is to create a general artificial intelligence. What they mean by that is to create an AI that can be as smart as a human, right? So complex reasoning, judgment, all of those types of things, right? The, the type of, it's not a narrow AI, it's an AGI. Mm -hmm. Some people, depends on which people you ask, uh, will say that this is five years out or 50 years out or it's never gonna happen. Right, and that those goalposts keep moving depending upon all sorts of things. But one of the things that OpenAI and DeepMind have done um, is that they they are strongly embedding in what they call AI safety. Right. So as they pursue their research, they also have teams in house that are devoted to thinking about potential perverse outcomes of what would happen. Right. So thinking about 
technological solutions as well as social impact solutions. They have ethics and societies team. I was on the DeepMind ethics and society team before going to APL. Um, you know, there's there's serious thought and consideration about how do you build a system that you can't do T, V, and V, um, and T and E in the classic sense. So you can't do testing, verification, validation, right? The formal models don't work on deep neural nets, right, with hundreds of thousands of parameters and things like that. So that work is being done. Um, whether it's correct is completely a different question. Um, the distribution of who is doing that work is also highly skewed towards a particular demographic. And so, you know, the kind of pale and male problem that is persistent in, in the tech industry is very much persistent in the AI safety community. Um, and so as advances kind of are made in that direction, you know, we, I think there should be a little bit of skepticism as well about, well, was this really a robust kind of uh, way of looking at things or, or maybe we should have more diversity and dimensionality to make sure that whatever the safety measures that they are coming up with are not just mathematical safety measures, but social ones as well. I want to speak more to the trust issue as opposed to the singularity issue, which is uh, um, I leave for others uh, uh, to speak to. And it's crucially important. Again, the testing and evaluation or verification and validation uh, approaches are being explored by the Air Force, the Defense Threat, Re Threat Reduction Agency. We had a five-year contract with them as well, too, and trying to understand how better these systems can work more in the wild. But it's really, really hard in these dynamic and unconstrained uh, situations. Um, one of the speakers, I think the first one after lunch, mentioned that these systems will never be perfect. They won't be perfect. Lethal autonomous weapon systems will kill civilians. Self-driving cars have killed civilians. Uh, as sooner or later, a drone is going to take down an airplane as well. And the real question is, how do we react uh, to that? Do we abandon the technology? Do we set it back 5, 10, 15 years? Or do we find ways as we are routinely killing each other on the freeways uh, right now. I keep watching the sign in the Georgia freeway of 478 fatalities this year. Nobody pays attention to that. Nobody cares, really. I mean, oh, that's an interesting statistic. Is it going to really change your behavior? Well, maybe one in a thousand might actually slow down a few miles per hour uh, as a consequence of that. But how are we going to manage this? And how are we going to accept it? And AI continuously vanishes into the background. It's everywhere. It's in this room. It's in your phones. It's in your cars. It's in your dishwashers. It's probably in this microphone, uh, for that matter. And as soon as it's done, it's not artificial intelligence anymore. It's the ever-vanishing definition of AI. So do we trust it? Well, when we don't see it, we kind of trust it at that particular point. But it's going to take a while, and it may be generational, uh, before we uh, deeply uh, accept many of these newer things that we have. But hopefully, we can still have progress, but ensure safety along the way as well, too. Yeah, on this point, I, I think, yeah, at least for, uh, for military application, in my opinion, one of the areas that we could probably look to to help us uh, and guide us is the work that's been done in driverless vehicles. Uh, it's not a perfect analogy because driving on a road uh, in a general one to two dimensional sense is a lot, l a lot less complex than uh, sending vehicles into uh, into the sea or into the air, three-dimensional environments, having to make very complex decisions. Uh, but it's a start that maybe perhaps uh, we've only begun to look at within the, within the military, uh, as well as some of the examples that you had mentioned. But that the combination of simulation along with live testing, I think, is maybe the best way to go for us to be able to more rapidly gain trust. Uh, the simulation helps lead, provide the initial foundation by which we, we could see what are the edge cases that we could test to see where we're having trouble, uh, where we're having issues with unmanned vehicles or other systems that are using the machine intelligence, but that getting it out into the field and testing it within constrained environments, but, uh, but still operationally constrained environments, is something that will allow us as both the, the military, I believe, uh, specifically to be able to get, test it in more unusual ways that we would not normally be able to see in the laboratory. Uh, one of the best things that we always discover is that when we get these type of systems into the hands of our very talented, very smart uh, young sailors, marines, soldiers, and airmen, that they're able to deploy them and then uh, test them in ways, kind of as you mentioned in, in Iraq and other places, in ways that are that we otherwise would not have been able to imagine the battlefield, and so we get a more realistic feel for them. It's not perfect, but it's uh, 
that combination hybrid way, I think, is the best way to proceed in order to uh, more rapidly get the testing evaluation trust trust building regime down and uh, and more salient. One of the gaps that connects the the prior topic I spoke to on um, social media and and how the companies are handling these responsibilities, and then linking back to what Heather was bringing in and others, is um, we have insufficient red teaming for these technologies, not in the cybersecurity meaning of red teaming of finding software vulnerabilities and flaws, but red teaming in terms of how the military thinks of it as an op for, basically a group of, I was part of a, a, a project um, uh, where you, you need to assemble a team of, we call them the nasty bastards. It's basically people who know and think like a wild diversity of bad guys. So it's, it, it's not, you know, uh, engineers from Silicon Valley, not even um, US Navy sailors. They're not going to be able to teach you how Hezbollah, how China, how a Mexican drug cartel, how um, Somali pirate. a Somali pirate, an alt-right troll, whatever it is, are either going to use the technology or counter it against you. So the driverless car parallel is, that's great. It worked um, on a highway in California. It worked in Arizona. Put it in Boston, right? Deal with Boston drivers and see what happens. The version here, to give you a real aspect that I was part of, was um, people touting um, a machine gun armed land robot, not autonomous, remotely operated, et cetera, et cetera, but basically, okay, talking all the good things that it might be able to do, and then we had some discussion around the counter of it, and um, essentially, and they were like counters, well, maybe they'll use cyber operations against it, everything that we would do. They'll try and hack it or et cetera. And someone who, um, myself and others who'd worked with, uh, this topic came up earlier in terms of um, what Paul mentioned, child soldiers, one-tenth of the combatants in the world are child soldiers. So the counter to the machine gun armed ground robot was not even an armed kid. It was what are you gonna do about it? The most lethal counter was a seven-year-old with a can of spray paint because they present a dilemma where either you shoot the seven-year-old or they walk up, spray the visual sensors, and they've defeated your system. Whereupon one of the Marine officers involved said, fine, we'll load it up with um, non-lethal weapon systems and tase that little kid. And I said, that's great, that follows the laws of war, but now you have the viral video on Al Jazeera of American robot tasing seven-year-old, unarmed seven-year-old. So my point is, these are the actual dilemmas that you have to work out, not just kind of the software flaws, et cetera. It's how will it operate in the real world and how will real world people interact with it? One last thing, uh, that's absolutely true. I, uh, and always trying to figure out those unusual strategies that your opponents will come up with as well too, may require an additional human escorts or something like that to be able to address those kinds of things. And I've always argued for a mixed force, uh, never to have robots uh, entirely dominate the, uh, the battle space, but rather to have uh, maintain a strong human presence as well too, which might help with uh, some of that. But the last thing with respect to- Can, the can I interrupt? Because we actually okay. already have an example. The great thing about it, we don't have to be in sci-fi. We already have an example of it right now where we operate unmanned aerial systems along the Iranian border. The Iranians then started to harass our robots with manned fighter planes. So then we then deployed F-15 and F-22 manned fighter planes to escort and protect our unmanned robots. There you go. We, the, but it's so it's so costly and it's so ridiculously stupid. Which is, which yeah. is the the adversary success, you know they but, they. But there may be better solutions as we think harder and longer about it. But I want to get back to the VNV issues, mm -hmm. just in the news again. Uh, best industry, best track record to my mind in terms of verif verification and validation is avionics, and just look what happened with the 737 Max uh, and the hundreds of people that died because of whatever reasons uh, for those sorts of things. There will always be weaknesses in software and the design of software. And one other thing that really concerns me with the use of this technology is the potential rush of the technology to the battlefield in the event of a high intensity interstate war or something like that. That's 
where things can potentially go wrong big time. Now is the time to invest in the safety issues and the testing issues and those sorts of things so that we are uh, prepared. I fear uh, that a rush to deploy the technology uh, will lead to uh, potentially catastrophic uh, consequences. I'd like to circulate one more question or topic and then uh, open it up to the audience. And it, it gets to uh, more of a culture question. And Sharif, I'm going to start with you um, uh, about, because you visited so many organizations in your recent work and your studies. So, and, and, and I'd like to sort of see what the panelists think about what we need to do better to have more of and the right combination of organizations, academia, uh, industry perspective, government, and different flavors in their NGOs in order to grapple with these problems a little bit more better and maybe improve communication as a first step. Sharif? Thank you. Uh, so I think there's kind of two points to it. There's the, the, the technological side. How can you know, some of these organizations help us technologically with the R&D of it? And then there's these, the social policy, the policy making side of it, the ethicist side of it, where how can these, uh, how can these different organizations provide us some insight or, or help us to think differently than maybe perhaps we as the, the military, Department of Defense, or other uh, government organizations think about it so we have all perspectives. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, across a year, to visit about uh, over 50 different uh, federally funded research development centers, university affiliated research centers, industry, academia, DOD, Navy labs, uh, in order to kind of see what, where they were on various aspects of AI, machine learning, un unmanned systems, test and evaluation. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I came to, to, to notice as I, I went to a lot of these different places, especially with regard to the commercial sector and the academic sector, kind of the, a growing sieve mill divide um, between the, the generations that are in Silicon Valley and other technological organizations uh, and the government and the military. And though, though it's, it's not uniform and it's not general across all of them, uh, there are certain areas where you, you don't see issues. Uh, but there's other universities and corporations where you do see them. I think Google was probably the best example uh, that we've seen with Project Maven uh, of that, but it's still uh, prevalent there. And part of it is an issue that, as I've kind of looked at and did research and, and interviewed folks, was that after the Cold War, we divested a lot of our R&D funding that normally would go to the academia and the commercial sector, uh, divested it to, for other things as part of the peace dividend, and that because of that, the the commercial and academic sectors had to fend for themselves and started pursuing other research that was more important to them and their bottom line, their profit, and, or their university institution, institutional missions. And so that now, uh, some 25, nearly 30 years later, we're almost two generations into, uh, into still, uh, both uh, university researchers as well as Silicon Valley technician folks who are not necessarily familiar with the previous close collaboration that the national security apparatus had with government or with the commercial sector and academia. And so we're seeing it now that uh, the reluctance to be able to, to partner with the DOD and partner with the government on maintaining certain levels of uh, advancements and technological progress, namely in AI, but in other R&D uh, areas. And so that, I have that concern because as we attempt to bridge those stovepipes uh, in order to to try to bring that synchronization and that alignment back into place, some of our near peer competitors don't necessarily have those those concerns, um, and so now we have a whole culture, uh, a cultural divide where we have to be able to bring people back into the fold and be able to show them that there's not necessarily a difference or a uh, a need to separate supporting government and national security levels uh, R and D with the work that's done in civilian and in the commercial sector and the academic sector. And that uh, being able to do that, I think, is of paramount importance because we're not, the DOD is no longer the center of all R&D like it used to be 25, 30 years ago. And so now we are relying on those other sectors in order to help keep us technologically advantaged with regard to the military uh, platforms that we're producing. And so with regard to that, that's one of my, the main concerns that I've started, continue to, uh, started and continue to talk about is how do we bridge those divides? How do we help the... Uh, commercial sector and academic sector better understand our needs and better understand that to get, you know, we need their help and they, they probably need our help so that we can help maintain national security. Things that I think both the uh, former Secretary of Defense and the, the director had mentioned today as well as concerns. Reactions? I, well, I can add something to that as well too. 
Again, many of us also, from an interdisciplinary perspective, feel we're kind of on a road show because uh, we bump into each other at different places. Uh, um, so uh, 2004, when I first started getting into this, very few people were talking about this. And now uh, it's much better, but it's also a cacophony because there's so many different groups and so many different voices and so many different meetings. It's hard to see how this could coalesce. One strategy, and especially among my colleagues, again, I would say the technologists, and the roboticists, and the others as well, too, are rather slow coming to the table compared to philosophers, I would say, and social scientists. Uh, um, with one exception, uh, which is there's uh, the IEEE is the uh, Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers is the largest professional society in the world, I believe. Uh, it's global in scope, and they have just finished uh, a multi-year, uh, hundreds upon hundreds of uh, people, including theologians and uh, philosophers and everyone else. I, have many of you participated? Any of you participated in the? Uh, uh, global Initiative on Intelligent and Autonomous Systems here? Uh, no? Nobody? Oh, I have. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So they just came out with a new document, uh, uh, Ethically Aligned Design, uh, and it is being used because IEEE has lobbying capabilities as a, an attempt to try and make change and raise consciousness and create webinars and produce a unified voice uh, among those folks at the very least to try and move forward the discussion. Uh, but we should keep doing it in many different ways as well, too, but at least that's one effort, I think, which uh, uh, has some momentum behind it. Our former Dean of Engineering here, Leah Jameson, was president of IEEE at the same time as being Dean of Engineering. As big as IEEE is, I think she said being Dean was harder. <laughs> <laughs> Other reactions to uh, this topic of culture and Converging the disciplines, Discovery Park exists for the express purpose of doing this, which is why we're having this meeting. So what are some other pieces of advice that we can so, activate? So I'll be a little bit of a, maybe a finger wagger on this one, right? Um, academics are terrible. Um, I'm, I'm a recovering academic. Um, and academics are terrible at kind of shaming other disciplines, right? We get this kind of hierarchy of like, well, you know, you're a physicist, you do this, or there's this whole joke, so I'm a political scientist and a philosopher, right? And it's not a joke like political scientist and philosopher walk into a bar. <laughs> um, but it, this idea, right, you know, all political scientists want to be like uh, economists and all economists want to be like physicists and there's this like hierarchy. And I think what happens is, you know, the hard sciences are the soft sciences. And we have to be, we, we have to be really, really careful about doing that to other disciplines when we want to be interdisciplinary. Because there's, there's like a, that power hierarchy is felt um, from other disciplines. And so when you want to be truly interdisciplinary, you have to be very open to different methodologies and different ways of knowing, um, different perspectives, and not kind of like, well, if you just had a little bit more engineering, everything would be great. Um, you might need a little bit more social science and everything will be great. You might need a little bit more sociology or something like that. Um, but I think making sure that true interdisciplinary work on these issues, which is required. This is the other thing about artificial intelligence. This is the other thing um, about all of these emerging applications. These are big problems, as Pete mentioned, right? These are whole of government problems. They're whole of academia problems, right? You can't, this is not a one technological fix. It's not like there's an electrical engineer or a computer scientist who's just gonna solve it, right? This is going to be an all hands on deck effort to create responsible technology, right? It's a responsible research and innovation movement, and to do it well and to do it thoughtfully, to have the right mathematical models for testing and verification, you need the mathematicians on board, right? You need uh, theoretical physicists for other things, right? You need all, all sorts of different people um, in this space and talking to one another. And so I think that kind of opening the aperture of talking about, it's not just a STEM problem, right? It's an everybody problem, and getting all of those people on, on board and being very welcoming about it, like the IEEE, for instance, um, will go wonders in, in kind of getting the right stakeholders to the table. Great point. Is, uh, is uh, Chris Yeomans here? I saw him earlier. Chris? Yeah. T tell us who you are and, and what you and I are co-chairing. Yeah. <laughs> the department head in philosophy. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Chris Showmans. I'm the department head in philosophy. Uh, Dan and I are co-chairs of the AI committee as members of the, um, 
the, what are we calling ourselves? The coordinating committee of the 150 years of Giant Leaps, the Ideas Festival. Yeah, so it's, it's a journey, I think, to your point that we've been on, right? But it's been a, a, a pleasure to, for an aer aerospace engineer uh, to work with someone like Chris. Uh, and I've, I've benefited greatly uh, from that. So it is a journey. Did you have something to say, Peter, before we're going to open up to the audience here shortly? I'll add a, um, you know, an optimistic note, but then a, a, a challenge that's um, hard for us to resolve. The optimistic note is uh, almost exactly 10 years ago when I was on my book tour for Wired for War, I went to one of your peer institutions, a, a leading engineering school, and um, spoke about the growing use of robotics in war and um, you know its positives, its negatives, et cetera. I didn't take like a ban robots position. And afterwards, a, and I'll always remember this, a, um, a senior engineering professor came up to me and angrily chastised me for, quote, troubling his students quote, by asking them to think about the ethics of their work. It, it was one of those literally, I was like, I can't believe you, you actually said, said that. Now that was 10 years ago. I went back and, and, the, and the idea was they're engineers, they need to just keep their heads down and build and all this other stuff is not for engineers to think about. Um, and obviously I personally disagree with that concept. Now what's interesting is I was back when I was on book tour for, for Like War about six months ago at that same university, they have since set up a program on wrestling with the questions surrounding ethics of new technologies and public policy. So he feels like a little bit of the old guard, um, rear guard action. Now, but this goes to what you were bringing up and you mentioned the controversy of Maven and, and maybe, you know, you, you said, Heather, um, we need to have, uh, you know, we've got different methodologies, but one of the other things we have to recognize, we're not going to agree on the ethics we're actually not going to solve it because ethics we will constantly argue about. Law we will constantly argue about. Um, so, you know, the, the idea, like the, what's playing out at, at Google internally is essentially a workforce that's wrestling, it's having kind of a, an awakening on what's ethical or not and disagreeing with their leadership about it. Um, to, uh, you know, it's the parallel of, um, me in the prior speech talking about the the person well if we could just solve the the first amendment issues we're never going to solve them right and it's the same thing here the laws of war will constantly be argued what's ethical will constantly be argued and so i fear that we may be setting ourselves up for a fall if we just bring everyone together from a multidisciplinary standpoint that we'll find the answer when actually the answer is that, you know, ethics and morals are, are constantly something that people argue back and forth, all the way back to Socrates and Plato to today. But it's still responsible innovation. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you definitely it's should done. do it. Yes. But I, 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 you know, you, and I'm saying you definitely should do it, but I, I fear we're kind of looking for that, that answer. We also, um, and one thing I would add on the, on the Maven project in Google, um, of all the first cases to reach out to a tech company in the DOD to work together on AI, drones and targeting. Come on, you didn't think this was gonna be controversial? And I actually spoke with the reporter who you know, kind of broke the story and I was like, would you have done a story if it had been about using AI to, and actually to, to make the Navy personnel system more efficient? which probably would be better for the US military. And he went, God, no, I would not do anything on that. So we chose as our test case, literally the most hot button controversial topic rather than kind of easing our way into the use of these. We should have known it was gonna blow up in our face. The, uh, all good points. And uh, to kind of go back to your earlier one about the uh, never being able to agree, uh, that's certainly true. The, the thing I think is important is that the, the ideas, the, the disagreements, the all the different positions go into the crucible of discussion so that the outcome of that will be hopefully a more informed position that policymakers and leadership take on, okay, we've heard all these different ideas where maybe we were much more to the, to, you know, geared to the left on this issue. Now we're a little bit more centered with how we think we may need, we should uh, actually apply and utilize these unmanned vehicles for you know, war fighting type of systems. So that gives us a better perspective. And I think that's really important, especially for the military, 
uh, and why the civilian civ mill divide always concerns me because uh, we need the, I think, in my opinion, we need the assessment, the scrutiny, the research, the analysis that academia does in order to help us come to you know, even more informed, better solutions as the Department of Defense. And so that, in, in that case, I always welcome those types of, uh, those types of inputs. And uh, even if the, the crucible doesn't exactly come out to everybody agreeing and linking arm in arm, uh, at least we've had those discussions and we're better for it. Uh, the last thing I'll just leave with is just, uh, the, the interesting thing about the Google case uh, was that it was actually a very small vocal minority that helped to get the whole Project Maven issue turned on its head. Uh, the vast majority of the, the Google workforce, because they had been so separated for, by a couple generations from national security work and collaborating with the uh, military, Department of Defense, and government, they were rather neutral to apathetic about it, but that in that absence, a small minority were able to kind of really ratchet it up and then generate that, uh, generate them to kind of align on their side, uh, which speaks to the issue that I think the, the government uh, and the Department of Defense really has to work on, which is that uh, recreating those those connections, those that culture of collaboration together, so that new generations, those who are just graduating now from Purdue and other different places, know that it's okay to work with the government, work with the Department of Defense, and that there is a common goal in, uh, in supporting the national security of the U.S. that is not necessarily going to violate their personal or ethical... Uh, starting with good examples, <laughs> as Peter said, is probably a good thing, too. Yes. Let's uh, take one or two questions from the audience now into this crucible assembled. Questions? I warned you at the beginning, and you knew this was coming, so. Thank you. Um, Sharif, to your point about the civilian-military divide, um, obviously the example after post-World War II was a very different environment on academic, uh, in, on academic campuses. Um, a lot less international students, et cetera. Um, the challenge, so how do, you, how do you see that challenge of overcoming that divide between the civilians and the military in academic campuses that um, in some cases have a significant, significant number of, of students that we would ca classify as from adversarial countries? I, I mean, it's a challenge that we're all faced with and Director Coates pointed out that, that at the global level we're, we're fighting those things. Um, but we're also fighting them in the ecosystems of our, not fighting them, but, but dealing and struggling with that challenge even in our own college campuses. Your, your point is, is very well made because we have seen it in a lot of different campuses to include the campus where I'm at, which is Princeton, which is the, uh, the desire to not exclude uh, students who are in technological or other fields that where they could normally be able to contribute and do research, but because it may bump up against classified type of research, uh, they become excluded and not trying to create that exclusionary type of experience. And uh, it, it's a tough one because the universities are playing more to being more and more open, but then if they want to kind of play in that domain, they're going to come up with some of those restrictions. Uh, I, I think w one of the examples that you, you often see is that certain universities will set up a separate organization outside of you know, the official university where although they may still be affiliated, whether in name or, or not, it, they're still able to do research, be able to have their, their SCIFs, their secret compartment uh, facilities, or other classified spaces, and then be able to have people who are clear to US citizens be able to participate in those without creating on campus the sense of haves and have nots with foreign nationals uh, versus US citizens. So that's kind of one way uh, in order to pursue it. And then the other way is just, I think, government and DOD helping to do a better job of creating uh, fellow fellowships and uh, exchanges and partnerships where we are uh, seen more on campus, uh, doing you in unclassified or uh, in unclassified work, but uh, more on campus, participating, uh, and so have a presence so that people get more familiarization. Because that's also what I usually see is lack of familiarization because lack of presence. Uh, and so we need to do a better job, I believe, in that regard as well. And then also being in Silicon Valley and other places with our folks so that they can interact with us and inviting them for short-term short uh, exchanges and the like to be able to get a better uh, example of us. One of the greatest programs that I've seen in, in the Navy was a program called Scientists to See. 
and he used to bring in people from all different walks of life in the science, uh, science and policy world to be able to come out to visit ships, submarines, aircraft carriers, to get a better idea of what actually is occurring and what the national security and their military does for them so that they could better take that back and have that grounding understanding while they're engaging with their peers. Excellent. One more time for one more quick question if someone has a burning one. Uh, Chris. Right, so thanks. Um, to some degree, I guess this is a question about general versus savant intelligence, and to some degree a question about how much ethics can be programmed into a computer system. So we were just talking about moral disagreement, right? And um, philosophers in particular are inclined to take a very negative view about moral disagreement and think that it's the problem, right? But I'm inclined to think that's morality. Right, is this tissue of disagreements and the constant conversation that we have. Or at any rate, that's the only morality we know and have ever known. And, and so I guess my question is, to what extent is that operationalizable or something like that? That's an excellent question. And I would speak to the fact we just recently received, joint with Penn State, a uh, National Science Foundation uh, award, a collaborative award with them, uh, studying competing ethical frameworks. Uh, and we will be, this is mostly for human robot interaction. The question is, you're right, even a single individual will not necessarily come to the same conclusion and will depend upon their state of mind or something else at a different point. Uh, there may be a pure Kantian that's a Kantian there all the time, 100% uh, of the time, but most people are a little more variable. Uh, and so we are studying, for example, uh, trying to develop a consensus of ethical experts on certain particular cases as to what is the right thing to do. And we will be building that up, try and find a way in which robots can replicate that and also reflecting the emotional or moral emotional state of the individual at that particular point in time, whether they're uh, embarrassed or uh, guilty or whatever it is uh, that may be appropriate. And we're also looking at folk morality, which is basically polling the average people, trying to say, what would you do under this particular circumstance? Uh, we are only doing this to try and replicate, if you have a robot with you, a small humanoid or something, so that it would give you the kind of advice that you would feel comfortable with instead of being a pure Kantian, which would tell you never, ever lie under any circumstances, which that's might not, true. not be the right thing. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that's one aspect of that. Uh, the, all this work is nascent. It's really in its infancy. The uh, machine ethics community has only been around for maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, so, there's a lot of stuff that remains unanswered at this point. I'm gonna take a stab at this really quick. Um, so one is ethics is action guiding, right? That's the purpose of ethics. Ethics is a moral framework that is about action guiding principles. And so when we talk about action guidance, that means that actions are gonna vary in the, in the world. So whatever your principle is, it's gonna be casuistry, right? It's case by case analysis, it's hermeneutics, it's interpretation. And so when you're thinking, when you're thinking about programming ethics into a machine, that already seems like a misnomer to me. Um, one, because you can program in principles, maybe, but that's even kind of odd because principles are very context dependent and they're concepts. And so right now, computers can't understand concepts, right? They lack the ability to do that. So you can encode rules for particular types of behaviors, but encoding ethics is something fundamentally different. Um, now, if you're talking about learning ethical behaviors or whatever that looks like, um, until they can understand concepts, they're just mimicking a particular behavior uh, that you want them to emulate. Uh, so if it, in reinforcement learning, for instance, right, you're just going to give them a reward signal to do a particular thing, and they're going to learn to do that. But they don't understand what they're doing is good right, or moral. So again, I, I kind of always want to be careful about using morally loaded language when it comes to machines in that way. But I want to, uh, let me just quickly uh, respond to that. AI is not all uh, neural networks, by the way, and a case-based reasoning is a strategy that can also be used, learning from experience and doing analogical reasoning as a basis for coming up with what would be viewed as ethical things. I agree with you, we have to be careful about the terminology, even when I say emotions, I always put them in quotes uh, as well, too. Uh, so uh, it gets, the discussion gets very confusing as you cross boundaries uh, quite often. Let's give our panel a hand. We will have to.